Welcome to the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Rochester. For over 150 years, ours has been a church of open minds and loving hearts, celebrating many sources of wisdom and many spiritual paths, practicing justice and compassion. Your faith, your doubts, your questions, and your hopes for our world are welcome here. Our doors are closed because our hearts are open, practicing our collective values of communal care and compassion. You can stay connected with us online through Sunday coffee hours and online groups and forums. You can visit our website or contact our staff to get connected with those or find links in your weekly e-news. And each week, our offering goes to support people within and beyond our church. This week was to be for Reclaim the Block in Minneapolis, organizing for reimagined public safety. They, however, have been so supported during this time that they're recommending giving to other organizations doing equally important work, including Minnesota Healing Justice Network, a mutual aid network rooted in reducing racial health disparities and practicing collective cultural practices for well-being in Minnesota through a variety of services critical work at the intersections of racial and health justice. You can give at uurochmn.org slash give, or you can go to our website, check out this link below, or you can contact the staff if you have any questions. Thank you for your generosity. And today we are so grateful to welcome the Reverend Ashley Haran and the Reverend Karen Hutt. Ashley is the organizing strategy director for our National Unitarian Universalist Association and Karen serves as the Vice President for Student Formation, Vocation, and Innovation at United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities in St. Paul. She's also an adjunct minister at First Universalist Church in Minneapolis. They live with their children in Minneapolis, and we are grateful for their voices and for their wisdom. Welcome. And in the words of the Reverend Eliza Tupper Wilkes, minister of this church in the 1870s, may our faith in humanity and our message of hope and good cheer light our way. It's good to be together. This is the Unitarian Universalist Church. This is the Church of the Flaming Chalice. This is the Church of the Open Mind. This is the Church of the Loving Heart, where friends come together and share. Today's story is a picture book based on one of my favorite children's novels, Wonder. We're All Wonders, written and illustrated by R.J. Palacio. I know I am not an ordinary kid. Sure, I do ordinary things. I ride a bike and I eat ice cream. I play ball. I just don't look ordinary. I guess I don't look like other kids. My mom would say I'm unique. She says I'm a wonder. My dog Daisy agrees. But some people don't see that I'm a wonder. All they see is how different I look. Sometimes they stare at me. They point or laugh. 
They even say some mean things behind my back, but I can still hear them. It hurts my feelings. It hurts Daisy's feelings too. When that happens, I put on my helmet. I put Daisy's helmet on too. And then we blast off, up, 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 up through the clouds, across the galaxy, all the way to Pluto. We say hello to old friends. From far away, the earth looks so small. I can't see any people, but I know they're there. Billions of people of all different colors. People who walk and talk differently. People who look different, like me. The earth is big enough for all kinds of people. I know I can't change the way I look, but maybe, just maybe, people can change the way they see, especially the way they see others. If they do, they'll see that I'm a wonder. And then they'll see that they are wonders too, because we are all wonders. And if we look with kindness, we will always find wonder. It's so important to recognize there are certain things about ourselves we just can't change. But those same things are what give us our superpowers and make us unique and wonderful. And if we can't change those things through conversation and speaking out and being kind to one another, we can help change each other's hearts and maybe the way that they look at those differences. Because honestly, it's those differences that make everything in this world so special. We are separated by space and time, but we are still together and we gather in a virtual way as we continue to create a place of communal caring and connection. Be enriched by the virtual presence of each other and draw yourself into the heart of love in this time of service and reflection. In this time together, we ask that our minds be open, our hearts welcoming, our arms embracing. We honor all who support us in this caring, loving, and all-inclusive ministry. We send gratitude to Diane Clausen, serving as our caring coordinator for the last week, arranging care for our members and friends in need. Rhonda Lorenz will take over tomorrow for the next two weeks, and we thank her for that. As we continue through this time of staying at home, 
Many of us may need additional care, whether it be grocery delivery, pastoral care, or an errand run, and we encourage you to reach out to Reverend Luke or myself with that request. We thank all of you who have offered to assist our members with these requests, and we send gratitude to you all for serving our congregation during this time. In this community, we make time each week to share pieces of our lives with one another. We do this because each person here has value. Each person's experience matters. We lift up those whose lives are touched by sadness, by illness, by worry, or by loneliness. We revel in those who are celebrating joys in their lives. May their happiness lift us all. May all of us find comfort, hope, joy, and healing strength in this community. We hold Steve Smith in our hearts this morning. On Father's Day, Steve suffered a serious vertebrae fracture after fainting. He spent the entire next week in the hospital and returned home on the 28th. For the next three months, he will have physical and occupational therapy, as well as be stabilized by a back brace. We send healing thoughts and strength as he and the family go through this time and through his monitoring and additional testing in the months to come. Cards of support would be appreciated as he recovers. Please keep Marty Peterman in your caring thoughts. Marty, diagnosed with throat cancer, will be starting chemotherapy and radiation in the coming weeks. We send he and Charlotte strength as they journey this road. Cards of support would also be appreciated. And we share some wonderful news from Janet and Fritz Breitenbach of the birth of their grandson, Solomon Roman Dunov, born June 17th to their daughter and son-in-law in Cleveland, Ohio. The new family is doing wonderfully and Janet is in Cleveland with them until the end of July. She shares that she is excited to be there and we share in her excitement for this new life. As we have over these last few months, we need to continue to reach out to all in our community to let them know that we are still here and still holding and supporting them. We encourage you all to send cards, make calls, support your local businesses, opening the doors of communication and community. May the faith and the spirit of life, love for the community of earth, and love for the light in each other be ours now and in all the days to come. I invite you to take a deep breath, breathe deep the breath of life, feel above you the ancient stars with their light, feel below you the earth and its ancient turning, both holding you here, you yourself made of earth and stars, sacred, beautiful, beloved. I invite you into this time of meditation and prayer, first by sharing breath and silence together. Spirit of life and love, God of a thousand names and beyond all naming. Sometimes it's hard to love a country, to love it even as it fails, to notice and name the ideals never realized, the dreams never met, the promises never true. May we be still on the way toward a love for country that calls it out and shakes it up tears down what is not just to build what yet might be. Let our love of country be rooted in a love of justice and for each other, for our collective well-being, a type of love that calls us all to reimagine what we can be, that works hard to tear down the monuments in stone, in law, in heart of what should never have been celebrated. Let us have a type of love for country and each other that remembers the promises made and broken and does the hard work of reparations, restoration, and repair. We hold this day all those who suffer in mind, in body, in spirit. I invite you to bring the names you're holding in your own heart in joy or in sorrow, in celebration or concern 
and silently are allowed now in this time to speak their names. For all those names and many others, may we all be held in love and grace and strength. These words of meditation come from Alice Walker. If you want to show your love for America, love Americans. Smile when you see one, flower like his turban, rose pink. Rejoice at the eagle feather in a grandfather's braid. How can there be homeless in a land so crammed with houses? Love your country by loving Americans. Salute the soul and the body of who we are, spectacularly and sometimes pitifully, who we are. Love us collectively, because we are the flag. May it be so. And amen. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great strong land of love, where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme, that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath. But opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery's scars. I am the native driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek. 
and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope tangled in the ancient endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need. Of work the men, of take the pay, of owning everything for one owns greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I am the worker sold to the machine. I am the Negro, servant to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean, hungry, yet to today, despite the dream. Beaten yet today, O oh pioneers, I am the man who never got ahead, the poorest worker bartered through the years. Yet I'm the one who dreamt our basic dream. In the old world, while still a serf to kings, who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true, that even yet its mighty daring stains, in every brick and stone, in every furrow turned, that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. For I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lea. And torn from black Africa's strand came to build a homeland of the free. The free, who said the free, not me, surely not me. The millions on relief today, the millions shot down when we strike, the millions who have nothing for our say. For all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be, the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again. America. America. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath America will be out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies. We, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plains, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plain. All, all the stretch of these great green stair states. And make America again.
five years old in my first month of kindergarten and my classmates and I are sitting cross-legged on the colorful carpet at our gentle teacher's feet. She reads us a hardcover book about a blonde, cherub-faced boy who accidentally wanders away from his mommy in the supermarket. When he bursts into tears, a helpful cashier holds his trembling hand, makes a call, and a kind police officer arrives, crouching down and consoling the boy. A few moments later, another smiling officer sweeps in with the panicked mother and looks knowingly at his partner as the pair is reunited. When the story is finished, our teacher looks at the sea of angelic pink faces on the carpet in front of her and smiles benevolently. Don't worry, little ones. If you ever get lost or get in trouble, you can always find a police officer to help you. They're here to keep you safe. I am 10 years old, and Mrs. Sullivan's fifth grade social studies class is my favorite hour of the day. I've just won a whole king-size chocolate bar for being the first to recite all 50 nifty United States in an alphabetical order. My small group just received an A-plus for our dazzling full-sized foam core display board, lifting up the struggles and the triumphs of the intrepid immigrants from Sweden and Finland and Norway and Ireland and Germany who bravely made their way across the vast prairie to settle this untamed, fertile land. And after months of reading Laura Ingalls Wilder's adventures, my heart full of admiration and yearning for such an exciting, noble life. The day finally arrives when our class climbs on the yellow school bus that will take us back in time to 1888 to spend a day at the Cahill School, a one-room schoolhouse where we will dress and act and learn as if we were pioneer children. After a day of riding on slates and curry combing goats and fetching water, we are enchanted. As we bid the historical reenactor playing the school marm goodbye, she waves and says, remember children, our history is our greatest treasure. Never forget the stories of the everyday people, people just like you and you and you who built this great country. I am 12 years old spending a week of my summer vacation with my grandma Mary in her small town Minnesota home. I revel in the freedom of small town life. I'm allowed to bike anywhere I want, run errands for my grandmother, stop at the drugstore or the lunch counter or the grocery store and just tell them I'm Mary Phillips' granddaughter and to put it on her tab. One evening she pulls out some old family photos, artifacts, letters, heirlooms. She tells me about my great-grandparents, the Tomalties, Irish immigrants who came to this country looking for a better life and scrimped and saved and made their way across the miles from the east, settling on this big, empty prairie and building, as if from thin air, a general store, the heart of this little town that was the birthplace of my great-grandmother and my grandmother and my mother in turn. You've never lived here, Ashley, but this is your home too. This place is yours. Your ancestors built this from nothing, with sweat and hard work. Their story is something you'll never lose, that you can always be proud of. I am 19, newly arrived at Harvard University to begin my freshman year of college. It's a Tuesday morning in September, the day before classes are to start and my roommate comes running, ashen-faced, into our common room. Turn on the TV, she says. A plane just crashed into one of the Twin Towers. We watch together, horrified, as the nightmare of that day unfolds. That evening, bleary and shaken, we make our way toward the quad in front of Memorial Church and stand shoulder to shoulder with thousands of fellow students holding candles, raising our voices in a chorus of America the Beautiful. By the next morning, American flags are pressed up against dorm windows, chalked on campus sidewalks, waving from every pole and branch and railing. And everywhere, from subway platforms to car bumpers to lampposts, the stickers appear. Freedom isn't free. Support our troops. Proud to be an American. Now is the time, the president and the news anchors say, to come together. United we stand, God bless America. In the spring of 1994, 
I was in the basement of the Maryland Historical Society with a black conceptual artist named Fred Wilson. I was an exhibit developer at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, where I was working on a major exhibition about Africa and the African diaspora. I had come to the East Coast to consult with Fred because he always had great ideas about how to visually tell stories about black people. He was developing an exhibit from the random artifacts of the Historical Society's basement. We roamed the temperature controlled rooms and alcoves with our special gloves and we picked up silver pictures from the 1800s and the endless numbers of obscure paintings that depicted wealthy Maryland families of the 18th and 19th century. We also found a section in the collection where the objects were labeled not for public display. On these shelves and in these bins were iron shackles, KKK hoods, whites only signs, and really dehumanizing images of black women, men, and children. A smile filled Fred's face as he picked up the shackles and that were used to enslave both of our relatives. He brought the shackles over to the ornate silver pitchers and placed them next to each other, almost touching, but not quite, and said, this is it. And from the juxtaposition of objects that he later titled metalwork, a major exhibit was being conceived. When Fred found a whipping post, it ended up becoming the centerpiece for the most dramatic and visually arresting portion of the entire exhibit. This century old instrument of punishment and torture designed for enslaved Africans was tucked away among a number of antique cabinets. This incongruous storage arrangement provided Fred with his ironic title for this section, cabinet making, 1820 to 1960. And by arranging antique Victorian chairs dating from the same period around the whipping post, he was with just few these few objects, with no labels and no historical video explaining everything, Fred showed us in that simple arrangement, the true nature of American hypocrisy. One of the ways that Fred Wilson made the invisible visible was by rewriting the tags of the museum's paintings and changing the lighting to redirect viewers' attention. In a series called Talking Paintings, Wilson gave black child slaves voices by playing recordings, asking such questions as, who calms me when I'm afraid? With the voices of children, he had them ask, who washes my back? Am I your friend? Am I your brother? Am I your pet? Who will love me? Who will wash my back? By altering the lighting and adding an audio track, Wilson drew attention to people and groups who historically have been rendered invisible and mute. 26 years later, I am reminded that I too still want to know, will America ever love me? Will America ever care for me? Will America ever see me as human? Will America ever hold my hand and squeeze liberty into my being? Will America ever be able to reconcile what is and what should be? Circle for the blind.
children of our children. Keep the circle Just prior to the Civil War, Unitarian minister Thomas Starr King said that the Universalists believe that God is too good to damn humans, while the Unitarians believe that humans are too good to be damned by God. I am black, circa 1619, a black without status or humanity, made in America, I am too good to be damned. I am a Unitarian who believes in self-determination of individuals in community, seeking, doubting, while being and doing. I am too good to be damned. I am a humanist who believes in the common good and that suffering is the randomness of nature and the result of human action. I am too good to be damned. I am a survivor filled with the power and resilience of my African, Negro, colored, Black, and African-American ancestors who continue to pursue happiness, joy, and love. I am too good to be damned. Despite the strident clarity of these declarative statements, the backdrop, the landscape that I stand before is punctuated by giant American question marks. Is she a human being? Can I let my knee off of her neck? Is it possible for me to see her as worthy of respect and dignity? Should she have the right to full citizenship? Will I ever love her? To be black in America is a constructive task of constant envisioning. We envisioned freedom when we read Moses in Exodus. We hear that all men are created equal and endowed with unalienable right to pursue their own happiness and we envision being enfranchised as citizens. When I first read the classical Unitarian works in college, I envisioned the potential and possibility in these words of freedom much like an enslaved African must have felt when they read the first few lines of the Constitution. But going further into these documents, the hypocrisy of the Unitarians is not unlike the hypocrisy of the country's founders. So why do I hold these documents? Why do I hold on to them? Why do I hold on to this movement? Why do I hold on to America? I do so because the possibility and the potential of these words are too attractive to let go of when we have built an entire country. I do so because the act of amending evil edicts to make them inclusive are too right to dismiss. I do so because my DNA configuration is a genetic code filled with white free male rapists, and the enslaved black female survivors. I believe that if white Unitarians really want to challenge the status quo of injustice, if they really want to save this country from devolving into a civil war, white UUs should not be calling me to see how I am doing with all the racism that is happening you should be talking to your white neighbors and relatives. Create a modern day abolitionist movement in your communities, a movement rooted in, your, in our two theological principles of inherent worth and interdependence. Abolish white ignorance. A black man couldn't possibly be bird watching in Central Park. Abolish white fear. I'm going to call the police on this black man who told me to put a dog on my leash. Abolish 
white supremacy, I'm going to get this black man put in his place because I'm going to call the police. Abolish whiteness as good and blackness as evil. Which side would you be on? We know from our Unitarian history that some Unitarians sought to end slavery and some sought to continue it. Theodore Parker hid and defended fugitive slaves, financed slave insurrections, and delivered fiery and powerful anti-slavery sermons. Yet most Boston Unitarians supported the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 and supported the continuation of slavery because of the wealth it provided for their industries. Why do I hold on to this movement? Why do I hold on to America? I do so because the possibility and potential of these words are too attractive to let go of. I do so because the act of amending edicts to, made, to make them inclusive are too right to dismiss. I do so because black people represent America's only chance, its only chance at realizing its potential for good. As many have said before me, so goes the Negro, so goes America. If Unitarians do not learn the lesson of our history and choose a radically different path forward, we may lose our last chance of creating a truly inclusive, egalitarian, democratic movement. While white Unitarians root their faith in freedom for self, they have read those same documents I speak of and see only themselves. These Unitarians are socialized to be functionally illiterate about American history, which starts with the lack of freedom for black people. That is the beginning of American history. Unitarians are by our nature opinionated, but not always informed. And if they are informed, the information becomes often glazed over in niceness and a fragile awareness that resists challenges. Awareness without strategic anti-racist action is functionally meaningless. Believing in good is not being good. Someday we might be able to say, we are too good to be damned because we abolish white supremacy. Someday we might be able to say, we are too good to be damned because we created communities of care and concern and commitment. Someday we might be able to say, we are too good to be damned because we've created relationships of mutuality with black people and not just curiosity and voyeurism. Someday we might be able to say, we are too good to be damned because we realize that the future of our faith will depend on us getting it right now or not at all. The Universalists believed that God was too good to damn them, and the Unitarians believed they were too good to be damned. Believe it or not, those were both incredibly radical theological positions back in the day. A rejection of the Calvinist belief in human depravity and a dismissal of the idea that some of us are predestined to hell while others are already chosen for heaven. While Karen reflected on the Unitarian side of things, the idea that we're too good to be damned, even and especially those of us whose society has over and over again tried to convince otherwise, I wanna spend some time with the other side of our religious family tree, thinking about what it means now in this particular spiritual political moment to live and act into our universalism. While there is a wide range of theological diversity among us, most modern Unitarian Universalists don't believe in a God who sits on a throne somewhere watching every action we take and then sending the sheep to the good place while the goats go on to live in eternal hellfire. One of the major teachings of Universalism is that the only hells we need to concern ourselves with are the ones we create for one another right here on earth through our complicity with systems of domination. 
the hell in which Derek Chauvin knelt for eight minutes and 45 seconds on George Floyd's neck and nobody stopped him. The hell in which Flint, Michigan still doesn't have drinkable water after five years and the Dakota Access Pipeline and Keystone XL are snaking their way through stolen lands. The hell in which Mercy Mack, a black trans woman killed in Dallas this week, is the 18th transgender person to be murdered so far in 2020. The hell in which more than 50,000 new cases of COVID-19 were reported today in the U.S disproportionately impacting black folks and disabled people and poor communities. And the public discourse is more of a partisan political debate than a collective effort to prevent millions from dying. I was indoctrinated from an early age, like so many of us are here in the US, to love this country unthinkingly, unquestioningly, but to live fully into my mature faith as an adult I have to grapple with the realities of hell, historical and present, right here in this nation that I call home. We all do. It just takes some of us longer than others to realize that there is no heaven for some of us while other people are going through hell. But the flip side of this is that universalism also invites us to imagine heaven a world in which every single one of us is fed and housed and safe and loved, a world in which it's possible to live into the full promise of the other half of our theological inheritance, that each and every one of us deserves the chance to blossom into our full and glorious belovedness. Right now, brilliant organizers and academics and scholars and healers are leading the way in shaping such a world. They are speaking into existence new structures of accountability, community safety, mutual aid, and shared resourcing. They are tearing down literal monuments to our history of oppression and domination, replacing them with art depicting true visionaries and leaders, warriors who were too long erased from the pages of our history books. They are organizing community gardens, funding Black, Indigenous, people of color-led organizations, convening space for healing and gratitude and collaboration on the internet. A mature universalism has as its beating heart not just the belief that this world and her people are worthy of salvation, but also the imperative that each and all of us are responsible for breathing that world into being with our actions, our practices, our resources, and our bodies. We do this in a thousand ways. Marching in protest, showing up at the city council meeting, ensuring everyone can exercise their right to vote, raising children with a love for freedom and liberation, redistributing our resources to frontline leaders who are imagining a different way of living, making heaven right here on earth. A land that never has been yet and yet must be. We, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plain. All, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. May it be so, and may we do so. Blessed be, Ashe, and amen.
May we be dreamers of what yet might be. This is my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for lands afar and mine. This is my home, the country where my heart is. Here are my hopes, my dreams, my holy shrine. But other hearts in other lands are beating with hopes and dreams as true and high as mine. May we all live the dreams of justice. Amen.